Good day, everybody. My name is Rob Thompson, and I'm going to try to explain antimatter to you using rubber ducks. And yes, I am talking about that antimatter that you've all seen in Star Trek powering the Enterprise across the universe. But antimatter is more than science fiction, it is science fact, and we now have the ability to observe, to make, and to study antimatter. Where does this whole concept of antimatter come from? Well, it comes from two foundational areas of physics. One, quantum mechanics. It is the world of the very small and very cold particles, or if you prefer, very small, very tiny rubber ducks. And it contains all sorts of interesting physics phenomenon, like your very tiny duck suddenly tunneling through a solid wall and appearing on the other side like magic. But quantum alone doesn't give us antimatter. We need another area of physics, relativity, which is Einstein's hey. favorite area and his favorite equation, E equals mc squared, comes from relativity. It governs very, very fast rubber ducks and has interesting phenomena like time dilation, things shrinking and stretching, the twin paradox where somebody in space ages at a different rate than somebody sitting on Earth. But eventually a physicist asked, what happens if I want to study a really tiny, really cold, really fast moving duck? Can I combine quantum and relativity? And Paul Dirac did this creating the Dirac equation. And the cool part of the Dirac equation is its solution is a quadratic. Quadratic equations have positive solutions and negative solutions. And when people first looked at the Dirac equation, the positive solution exactly explained my very cold, very small, fast moving duck. The negative equation, they just said, oh, that's a math thing. We won't worry about it. But eventually somebody said, well, what if that's not just a math thing? What if it's real? What if it predicts a different, very small, very cold, very fast moving type of, of duck as a perfect mirror image of my matter duck, antimatter. And by the 1930s, we were observing it in cosmic rays coming in. You could see positrons, which are the antimatter equivalent of electrons, which run around our atoms here. So if antimatter exists, what can we do with it? Well. Relativity says E equals mc squared allows us to convert mass to energy. With antimatter and matter, because they're perfect mirror images, when the two meet, they annihilate and convert all of their mass to energy. That's by far the most efficient way to generate energy. Why don't we use it? Because we don't know where the antimatter is and we don't know how to make it, at least not efficiently. So if we're gonna do anything with antimatter, we need to study it, we need to understand it. And that's what we're doing at CERN. And specifically, what we're thinking about is, not only does physics say that matter and antimatter need to be perfect mirror images of each other, the, the production of them has to be a perfect mirror image as well. That is, every time I make a matter particle, I must make an antimatter particle. Every time I make an antimatter particle, I must make a matter particle. We should have just as much matter around, in the world around us as antimatter. Is that the case? What if this wall over here is antimatter? If I touch it, my finger will explode. I'll do that because it's not high risk, because I know that's made out of matter. So if the matter is not here, where is it? Or why isn't it here? And that's what we're trying to study. Now those two facts, the perfect mirror image and the equal amounts are tied together. If we disprove one, it will, it will disprove the other. And disproving those perfect symmetries doesn't say our physics is wrong. It says there's something there that we don't know about. So at CERN, we are studying our antimatter, specifically anti-hydrogen, measuring its color, measuring its charge, measuring its mass, measuring how it interacts with gravity, and comparing that to a uh, normal matter hydrogen atom. And if we can find any differences, then we can start to change our understanding of physics around us. And so to summarize everything I've talked about up to this point about the study of antimatter, it can be boiled down to the question, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, is it a duck or is it an anti-duck? <laughs>